Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Andrea Mummert. I'm with the Solano Resource Conservation District. Thanks for joining the webinar, Building Healthy Soils and Creating Wildlife Habitat on Farms. Um, today's webinar has been created as a part of the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Program. And that Healthy Soils Program provides funding support for the implementation of soils best management practices. And the program also funds educational workshops like this one um, with the hope of helping more agricultural producers and agricultural professionals to learn about healthy soils practices um, in hopes of being able to have them be more widely adopted and implemented. Before we get started with today's workshop, I will um, briefly go over the agenda. We're gonna be hearing from four speakers. Um, First, we're going to hear from my colleague at Solano RCD, Amy King, and she's going to be telling us about a particular Healthy Soils Program demonstration project at the Wild Oak Vineyards in Sassoon Valley. After that, um, we're going to be hearing from Daniel Rath with the University of California Davis Soils and Biogeochemistry Graduate Group with a discussion about soil microbiology and carbon storage in soils. Um, after Daniel, we're going to take a 10 minute break at that time. I'll put up a placeholder slide. So if you come back and check, um, you'll know we're still on the break until that placeholder slide goes down. Um, after the break, we're going to be hearing from Jessica K. Cruz from the Xerces Society. And she's going to be talking about um, pollinator conservation and how some of the healthy soils practices can benefit pollinators. And then lastly, we're gonna hear from Sarah McKibben with Solano RCD, taking a focused look at monarch, Western monarch conservation status and needs. Um, before we move into those talks, I wanted to quickly go over uh, some of the logistics of how we're hoping to use the Zoom technology today. So first, if you have questions that come up during one of the speaker's presentations, if you could put that into the Q&A. So somewhere either in the top um, toolbar or maybe at the bottom of your screen toolbar, you'll see a Q&A icon. And if you click on that, it'll open a Q&A panel. So if you could just type any questions you have into that Q&A panel, at the end of each presentation, we'll be reading the questions as many as we can get to and answering them. Um, if, if we don't have a chance to get to your question, at the very end of the present, at the end of the webinar today, we will have we'll be sharing a slide with everybody, all the speakers' emails, so you can follow up directly with any of the speakers with a question that didn't get answered. Um, also, during that Q and A time, if you have personal experience with um, one of the discussion points or practices that's being discussed, and you think it would be valuable for our other um, attendees to hear about you're welcome to raise a hand. Um, again, there should be an icon for raising a hand in one of your toolbars and um, we can come get to you and unmute you for your comments. Uh, unfortunately, we're expecting a fairly large number of attendees up to a hundred today. So um, we probably won't be able to get to everybody in that kind of open discussion, but um, go ahead and you can raise your hand and as time allows, we'll get to your, your input. And then um, I also wanted to mention, you probably have a chat uh, icon in your toolbar. And we're hoping to just use the chat for technology issues that come up, because we'll see those, those chats right away. So for your questions for speakers or comments, please put that in the Q&A and use the chat for any kind of technology problem you're experiencing that you think could be on our end. So if you can't see a presentation or hear a speaker, if you can put that in the chat, um, we'll see it right away and try to take care of that. Um, so, oh, and the last thing is if there is anything or if you want to share this workshop with anyone else or if you miss part, we're recording, um, being recorded right now and it will be posted on our solanohealthysoils.org website. It's down at the bottom of the screen right now. It'll be on the workshops and events page. So um, it'll be up in a couple of days after, after this. 
And I think that's everything you need to know. One person asked earlier, just so you know, yes, all the participants or the attendees rather are not on camera right now and you're muted. The only way to become unmuted is to click that raise hand button and during the Q&A times, um, we can get to you and unmute you. So with that, unless, um, Amy, unless you have anything to add, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you for your discussion of the Wild Oak Vineyard site. All righty. Well, thanks so much for coming, everybody. Let's see. Does that look good, Andre? Everybody can see my slide? It does. All righty. So this, um, as Andrea mentioned, this um, is focused on a particular site in the Sassoon Valley. And I have a, um, a little map here. If you haven't been to the Sassoon Valley before, it's a, a pretty small, um, really beautiful spot northwest of Fairfield, um, indicated in the circle there. And it's um, historically been a lot of stone fruit, uh, is currently a lot of vineyards. And the Sassoon Valley Vintners and Growers Association has a really great website if you're interested in learning more about the area um, and a little bit about what's grown there. And I was fortunate enough to um, be in contact with landowners who purchased some property a few years ago, this 30 acre vineyard. Um, and they, they had a number of, of goals for this property um, among them and, and why I was originally called out was actually um, flooding concerns from Ledgewood Creek. So this is Ledgewood Creek that runs along the bottom and, and I should say what I'm going to do here is kind of whip fairly quickly through kind of an overview of what this project entails and our big goals. Um, and if you have any follow up questions afterwards, always feel free to email me because um, this is going to be fairly quick. But so in, in working with the landowners for, for a year or so, they had a, a couple of goals for this site and and one of them. Sorry, here I've got to move where I'm looking um, was to achieve and maintain certification with the Lodi Woodbridge Wine Grape Commission's Lodi rules for sustainable wine growing. And so among those rules are a lot of best management practices for soil health and um, kind of environmental impact. And so that is always kind of on the forefront of our minds as I work with them at this site. Um, but we're very interested in creating wildlife habitat and a particular interest in monarchs. Uh, we'd like to maintain as much perennial vegetation as possible on the ground and this is always a good thing for increasing water infiltration and decreasing flood risk. And it's also a great thing for outcompeting weeds. So that's a, that's a big goal for the landowners and a big goal at this site. Um, we're interested in, in beautifying the road fronts. This is actually a really, um, for Sassoon Valley, it's quite a busy <laughs> street corner. This cross section, it gets a lot of local traffic and uh, the landowners are interested in making it look as beautiful as possible. And we're also interested in sequestering carbon and being a positive part of the climate solution through agriculture. And finally, as, as Andrea mentioned, this is a CDFA project and it is aimed to serve as a local demonstration of the successful implementation of these practices. And the practices I'll get into in a moment, but I did want to, um, to note that there are quite a few sources of funds coming into this project. Um, the landowners have a um, equip contract through the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service program. So that's something that the landowner applies for. They hold the contract. They get reimbursed as practices are completed. Um, and those are um, a rolling deadline. Equip is something a landowner can apply for at any time during the year. And then those applications are batched a few times a year, ranked and um, contracts are awarded. The CDFA Healthy Soils Program, they have a number of different programs, one of which runs very similar to Equip that landowners apply for. But this one was a demonstration program that we at the RCD applied for. So we hold that contract. It's about two thirds of the money to make this project happen. And we work directly with CDFA um, to meet those deliverables. And then we also have some funds from the US Fish and Wildlife Services Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. This is a really fun program to work with that we have um, quite a few times over the years. And so we have a pocket of funds with them that is specifically set aside to purchase any materials and supplies necessary for installing hedgerow projects around the county. And we have a number of sites around the county with hedgerows. So the, here, sorry, I'm just make sure I can see everything. There's a few things that we were trying to do at this site, you know, very specifically with, with all of these project funds. And they were 
to install a perennial cover crop in all the vineyard alleys. It had been on and off, um, had an annual cover crop. We're doing a, a 5,800 foot hedgerow around the vineyard and along the driveway. Installing some nesting boxes for barn owls and kestrels and doing about 1.6 acres of riparian habitat restoration down near Ledgewood Creek there. And then because outreach and education is a big part of this project, we also created the Solano, he Solano Healthy Soils website and a blog, um, which was, you know, we are just getting started with the field component of this project. So the blog will get more interesting here <laughs> pretty soon. So one thing that CDFA requires um, is some baseline soil sampling. They would like to have everybody track changes and hopefully improvements in some basic measurements of soil health over time. So we did the baseline soil sampling actually in the fall of 2019. We, soil, we sampled for soil organic matter. We got wet infiltration rates. And we also conducted uh, something called a Haney test, which is interesting. Um, and it uh, just gives some indicators of biological activity. And I was interested in doing this because um, CDFA is hope, we're all hoping that I, that a certain amount of carbon, as much as possible, is sequestered over the course of time after you install things like perennial trees and shrubs and perennial cover crops. But capturing that change in a short time period, like the three-year grant project period, is, is really hard. But there are lots of indicators that you're headed the right direction via biological activity and, and microbial activity. And so that's what the Haney test looks for. And, and we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of this at all. I just wanted to put it out there for CCAs and farm managers present that it, it is an interesting, um, it's an interesting analysis of soils to track biological activity. And the, the uh, contact info for the lab we did it with is actually in, in the Midwest in Nebraska is down there, but I've been really happy with working with them. You get some interesting information and the soil here, this is, you know, we just have baseline, the soil here is actually quite lovely. And um, there isn't too much to look out here other than how it changes over time. So we'll, we'll be sampling again in the fall. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly go through the, the practices we're doing and just kind of let you know what we're what our plan is. Um, the perennial cover crop was installed uh, last fall, fall 2020, and it was um, all with seed mix from La Ballisters in Santa Rosa. And they, so they have some preset mixes and the landowners um, worked with their staff to, do, to combine some of them for one of the most diverse cover crop mixes I've ever been involved with putting in in the field. I'm really curious to see what comes up um, so they they took their vineyard special mix and mixed it with an insectary mix and then added lupins. So we've got kind of a, a classic perennial cover crop mix of Blando brome, crimson clover, rose clover, and zorro fescue. That stuff that comes up real fast, the, the grasses and stuff that comes up slower, like the clovers, um, all of which usually work quite well together. And then they added all that insectary, all those flowering plants to basically just kind of hedge their bets and see what would come up and try to provide as much insectary habitat for pollinators as possible. And so far, it's everything looks like it's germinating really well. It went on, it went on real thick and um, germination looks great. It is not very weedy at this point. So the hedgerow is going to go all the way around the vineyard and then along the driveway, you can kind of see that in, in, in purple down there. And the reason I have this broken up into sections is because it's a, it's a big area and there's kind of different suites of plants that are going to go in different sections depending on depending on the area. So we've got power lines we have to stay under in some areas. We didn't want to shade out the vines um, along this west edge. So we're keeping really big trees and shrubs over on the east side, kind of provide a nice screen. Um, and But as much as possible, we're focusing on beautification and provision of insectary and pollinator friendly plants. So our only constraints really are the rules imposed by, by EQIP and CDFA, which are good ones. Um, they let us have up to 20% non-natives. So it's definitely focused on native species that wildlife will recognize and use, but we can have up to 20% non-natives. So all the things like the lavenders and the rock roses and things that have, are prolific bloomers and the pollinators really like, um, we're keeping those to 20%. And we're also um, supposed to keep harvestable products to only 5% or less, but those can be really fun components of hedgerows too, particularly in an agricultural setting. So we're gonna throw in some persimmons and pomegranates. Um, you can see this is a, and this is not the final list actually of species. We're still kind of working out um, what some of the little flowering things that are gonna be coming available, um, but it's a really diverse plant list and I'm, I'm really excited to see what will, what will thrive. Um, we're gonna do this installation in the next six weeks, basically. 
So barn owl boxes, we love barn owls. Um, and the, the stars on the map are the places where we're going to be putting them. I did cluster them all towards the south of the vineyard to stay away from power lines. Um, we've definitely had issues in the past with barn owl boxes being too close to power lines. And eventually it seems like somebody's gonna get caught in one as they try to swoop into their, to their nesting box. But we, um, at the RCD, we often work with scout troops to create our, our owl and kestrel boxes. And, and we did here as well. It was really a great experience. So we had an Eagle Scout troop um, build barn owl boxes and kestrel boxes for this site. They did an amazing job. It's a lot of work. The barn owl boxes are, are big. Um, and we will be putting, we've augered the holes and we'll be putting those up hopefully next week if it's not too stormy. So the riparian area, I am, um, because there's so much to install for the hedgerow and these barn owl boxes, we're gonna install the riparian vegetation next winter. But the plan out there is about 300 native trees and shrubs, a lot of milkweed plugs to create monarch habitat. And really we're very lucky that this site is not overly weedy at all, but there was one, you can see a very large patch of, um, of Arundo, that invasive bamboo along Ledgewood Creek. This is my, if you can see my mouse, he's very camouflaged. That's my coworker, John. That's how tall the Arundo was. It took a couple of days to get it out, but we will have eradicated that patch and then it will be gone from at least that, that part of the creek. And so the other part of the, the project is our Solano Healthy Soils website as Andrea mentioned. And so we are adding stuff all the time. This is a great place to come for workshops and events and continuing ed opportunities around the county. Um, like I said, and any major field activity, we will have um, some blog entries. It can be an interesting place to check out um, for other events similar to this one. And I won't spend too much time on this, but, I, but because it is a focus of the of CDFA's program, oops, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, to quickly remind us about, about the carbon cycle. Um, oh my goodness. And, and uh, note that, so we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of this, but where this project fits in, where, where we're really hoping to have an effect on the carbon cycle on this farm is really in the vegetation. So things like planting big trees and shrubs, and that leaf litter will fall off and hit the ground and the roots will senesce and, and grow over time and become part of the soil carbon pool. And over time, we expect that to have some significant increases in the amount of carbon sequestered on site. Uh, similarly, over here, the um, perennial cover crop will, some of those, those clovers, any of those legumes will fix nitrogen as they um, grow each year and slough some root tissue and, and drop some leaf litter. All of that will stay on site and hopefully slowly build um, a healthy soil microbial community and, and soil carbon pool. And I threw this on here just, just as an example of, so this is something that um, CDFA um, wants everyone to calculate for these projects. This is the estimated annual tons of CO2 equivalents we expect to be taken up at this site for these practices we've installed, the permanent cover crop, a hedgerow, riparian forest, and then some riparian herbaceous stuff. And this is using the Comet model. That's a, a you know, just very rough estimates of this stuff that NRCS um, developed. And so it's kind of the standard for looking at just getting a ballpark idea of how much carbon you're gonna sequester. And and honestly, things like planting perennial trees and shrubs you know, aren't hugely impressive numbers. But so I always like to keep in mind that there's all kinds of reasons that we like to do these things on farms. Um, we do hope that they have a, a climate benefit, but there's lots of co-benefits. And so I'll, I'll just real quickly remind us kind of why we do like to do these things. Um, they, sorry, I have such an issue with moving my own little face. It covers what I'm trying to read. So um, keeping vegetation on the ground is always going to increase water infiltration and groundwater recharge. We like that. Um, we especially like that here. It is a flood prone site and they have some issues with standing water and vine health. Um, we like to create wildlife habitat and provide habitat for pollinators. All of these things that have carbon benefits also have these benefits. We can reduce um, summer surface soil temperatures, which is a good thing. That hedgerow will provide a nice windbreak. Um, the nitrogenous or the nitrogen fixing cover crops will help. There's also actually a couple of nitrogen fixers in the hedgerow, some ceanothus. Um, we'd love to see an increase just overall in soil microbial diversity and function. And the, the more diversity we can put on the ground in the form of trees and shrubs and cover crops, um, 
the more diverse our microbial community should be. And um, hopefully we'll get some increased weed control via competition from a, a really um, strong perennial cover crop and from predation from all those barn owls. We have yet to put up a barn owl box anywhere that doesn't get moved into pretty quickly. They're pretty amazing. Um, and I think importantly, we're meeting market demand for environmentally conscious farming. You know, wine grapes are, have the, the wine grape industry has been an absolute leader in this, in this idea of, of integrating environmentally sustainable practices into their, into their operations and really finding a, a market demand for that. So I know that was a really quick breeze through. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, interest in participating in anything out here in the future, we certainly are hoping to move to more in-person workshops and kind of hands-on participatory stuff over the next year. Feel free to give me a call or check out our the Healthy Soils website or our Solano RCD website. Thanks, Amy. Um, so now is the time that if anybody has any questions, um, you could raise a hand to speak or type it into the Q&A. Um, we had just one question come into the Q&A, whether Amy, you could share your presentation. So we'll plan to put the PowerPoint as well as the recording of this webinar um, at solanohealthysoils.org on the workshops and events page. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it looks like that might be it for questions for now. Um, we're just exactly on time. So, uh, oh, here comes one. Let's see. How long has this project been in the workings? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let's, I started working with the landowners in the fall of 2018. Um, it, and it honestly started as looking at um, drainage and kind of flood issues. So it, it's been just a couple of years, a little over two years. Yeah, it took about a year to put together the, the pieces of funding. Um, and Amy, I have a question for you, and I know you weren't trying to go too long into the carbon cycle, but um, when you were mentioning the ways that the carbon pool in the soil will get built up from sort of the roots and the leaves and this sort of thing, does having a larger soil carbon pool contribute to uptake from atmospheric CO2? Oh, interesting. So, and Daniel, um, our next speaker could certainly speak to this better than me, but um, so I think there's a couple things at play. If you, any carbon source you put into the soil system, particularly the more digestible of them, um, it's food for the microbes. So you, you increase soil microbial population and diversity, probably if you're putting a diversity of, of carbon sources into the ground. And so it's kind of like a positive feedback loop. Um, the increased soil microbial diversity and population in theory can help build healthier, bigger plants that are then also then more efficient at taking up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Sounds great. Okay, we have a couple more questions that came in. Um, did the vineyard also introduce compost? Oh, good question. They did not, no. You know, in, in vineyards, um, that's a, that can be a little bit of a, a tricky question because they're, they don't want tons of nitrogen always. So th these soils, and I should have mentioned that the soils are lovely. It's mostly YOLO loam. They have really nice soil. They don't need tons of nitrogen. Um, and they don't need, a, from a wine grape growing perspective, they don't need a whole lot of anything. And so, no, they, they decided to, to just go with a really robust perennial cover crop instead. They, they didn't put soil to, um, compost down first, although you, you certainly could, and you would probably increase your carbon benefit significantly. Great. And then our last question is um, specifically about monarchs um, and concerns about their decline and how much acreage might be needed to help them. I think we'll maybe defer that question to Sarah's presentation. So our last speaker today is Sarah McKibben from Solano RCD and she's focusing on monarchs. She should be speaking around 1120. So hopefully you can um, still be here then. If not, again, you can uh, watch the presentation recorded or reach out to her. So with that, um, we'll move to Daniel's presentation. Um, Daniel, can you hear me right now? Yep. Fantastic. If you are ready to share your screen, I think we're ready to see your presentation. Sure, no problem. Let's see, can you all see that? Uh, we see a, bla a black screen right now. Oh, 
strange. All right, give me a second. Now we're seeing, we saw a glimpse of it. Oh, you saw a glimpse of it. All right. <laughs> Let's, you know, take this. No, no technology goes exactly as planned the first time. Okay. How about that? Yep, we got it. All right. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Rath. Um, OK, there we go. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Daniel Rath. I'm a graduate student at UC Davis. Um, I specialize in soil microbiology um, and soil carbon storage. And I'm here to talk to you today about a topic very near and dear to my heart, which is the link between healthy soils and healthy microbes. Um, so Amy gave a really good introduction, I think, to soil uh, health and the things that you get are trying to do in the Solano RCD project um, focused on soil health. But uh, I like to start my presentations off just making sure everyone's on the same page. Um, uh, I find soil health is a really popular topic these days, and a lot of people have heard a lot about it. Um, but just to make sure everyone's kind of thinking along the same wavelength. So very quickly, what is soil health? Um, I like the best analogy I have is a comparison with human health. So if you think about what makes a healthy human body, you think about being efficiently able to use the nutrients that you take in, taking that food and turning it into energy or turning it into cells, um, building and regenerating yourself, um, a strong skeleton, strong musculature. There's a lot that you can do, a lot of heavy lifting uh, and disease prevention. You're able to heal, you're able to regenerate yourself, you're able to fight off infection. Uh, much in the same way, a healthy soil has very efficient nutrient cycles. So when you put nutrients in, the soil is able to utilize that to build the microbial biomass, it's able to use those nutrients to grow plants. Um, carbon transformation, so they're able to use that energy. Uh, basically, the carbon is the energy source that powers uh, the soil. They're able to maintain soil structure. So um, very often when we till or when uh, erosion and disturbance happens, soil structure gets destroyed and a healthy soil can regenerate that quickly so that you continue to have good infiltration um, and disease and pathogen resistance. So you, you know that they're able, they don't have a lot of pests or a lot of disease associated with it. Um, but one of the main things that for both humans and soils, if you're healthy, you're able to self-maintain. Right, they're able to, if there's a disturbance, they're able to correct and they're able to regenerate themselves. Now, there are a lot of benefits of healthy soils and I'm sure these have been harped on many times. Um, healthy food production, food security, uh, infiltration was mentioned before, that's a really big one. Um, it allows down through the soil more easily, um, as well as encouraging biodiversity and helping us adapt to climate change. So storing that carbon in the soil is a really good way to manage um, climate change. Uh, one that's been getting more and more uh, airtime recently, especially in the research, is the link between soil health and human health. Um, it's kind of twofold. One is that if you have healthy soils in a region, you're more likely to have um, access to healthy food, um, nutritious vegetables, fruits, and such. But another thing is the link between the soil microbiome and the human microbiome. So the microbes in the soil, where you live, where you get your food from, often show up in, in the microbiome inside yourself. And so there are very strong links between having a healthy soil and having a healthy population that depends on and lives on that soil. Um, I find that in a lot of these cases, when you talk about microbes and soil biology, it's all in the abstract. Um, I, I have, I, I like to think about like, to like have a picture in my mind of what they actually look like. Um, so there's a really good artist in Sweden that does drawings of soil microbes. Um, and it just kind of highlights the amazing diversity of shapes, amazing diversity of functions that you have in there that are all normally too small to be seen by the human eye. Um, so this has state a that basically a suit of armor surrounding it um, that it sticks its head out in order to feed. You have columbula. Uh, these are like the hyenas, the scavengers of the soil world. They're little mites that kind of like go around, they clean up this. 
Um, they can also be quite nasty predators, depending on how big you are. Um, you have Vorticella, which is a um, fungi that grows on this little spiral stalk, has a fruiting body on top, and it reproduces by uh, spreading spores. Uh, and then you have my favorite, which is the Flugia, which is this tiny amoeba that constructs little houses for itself, a uh, little suit of armor out of like detritus that it finds just like lying around in the soil. Um, so there's huge diversity of shapes and forms and functions and everything eats something different. And so it's a very complex uh, web. Thinking about scale. So to put the scale in terms of something that we can relate to um, in terms of human scale. So if you were to think of a soil microbe as the size of a person, or rather yet, shrink yourself down to the size of a soil microbe, um, then if you take a silt and clay particle, which is probably the smallest unit of soil you can think of, it's way smaller than a grain of sand. It's usually too small to be seen with the human eye. Um, if you're a microbe, that's about the size of a semi-trailer. Um, if you take a microaggregate, which is the smallest unit of soil structure that we think about, that's a little bit smaller than a grain of sand. It's a couple, maybe silt and clay particles glued together. Um, and again, it's usually almost too small to be seen by the human eye. That's about the equivalent of the Statue of Liberty to a microbe. And then finally, if you get a clump of soil, it's about two inches big, um, which is sort of the scale the equivalent of act on you like you can have a huge amount of free space available um 11 miles you can imagine like you could fit quite a few people into 11 miles of land you could fit quite a few microbes into a two inch clump of soil not all that soil is available where the microbes actually live is the free space inside it uh, those are the pores that are created by roots, pores that are created by earthworms, by other larger organisms. Um, that free space is where microbes are able to congregate and where a lot of the water also flows through. Um, so as I mentioned, there are huge, this is a huge and very complex and very diverse um, network of living organisms. Uh, bacteria and fungi are on the lower level of that network, but you, you know, you can go up in size, even things like gophers, nematodes, um, moles, even burrowing owls are all part of this soil food web, this soil ecosystem. Um, if anyone is a little bit more curious about this, the NRCS has a really good soil primer on their website. Um, and it gives like a really clear walkthrough, very concise walkthrough of like these different levels. Um, so my, you know, I am a microbiologist. I focus on the base level of this food web, the nematodes and the fungi and the bacteria. But there's one level below that. That is the energy source that powers this entire network. The energy source is what powers the entire soil and keeps it going. And that's uh, soil organic matter. So as um, Amy mentioned before, soil organic matter, uh, you can think of it as microbe food, right? It's it's like a battery, much like all food is. It's light from the sun trapped in solid form. Um, and by consuming it, by respiring it, we can get access to that energy. And that's what powers most of the ecosystems on Earth. So soil organic matter is made up of plant, animal, microbe, remnants, dead microbial bodies make up a large portion of that um, soil organic matter. It's what gives soil that sort of rich, dark color and that really like loamy feeling when you're when you feel a soil that you look at it and you think to myself you think to yourself this is really fertile this, i'm going to be able to use this to grow stuff it's often because you feel the presence of a large amount of organic matter um, and it contains a lot of different nutrients it contains carbon nitrogen phosphorus potassium sulfur all of the good stuff that you need um, in order to grow plants in order for microbes to grow their biomass. Um, it's really the one-stop shop when you for anything that comes to um, energizing and providing power to the soil microbes. Um, it has a lot of different roles, which is why you hear so much about it. Uh, soil organic matter is microbe food. It is 
provides the impetus for the formation of soil structure. Um, and you know, when you think about a clump of soil, uh, the clump of soil itself is not important. What you think about is that if you have two clumps next to each other, there's going to be a crack in between, uh, and that crack is a pore. And so, if you have uh, if you have good soil structure, you have a lot of these different clumps. That's what allows the pore structure in soil to form, and that's what allows water to infiltrate. That's what allows microbes to like live and move. And so, it's really this aspect of like forming soil structure is a really important part of like the job that soil organic matter carries out. Um, it also provides nutrient storage and slow release over time. So again, all of that carbon and nitrogen, phosphorus, everything that's trapped inside that organic matter is released slowly when microbes consume it for energy. And those nutrients can be used by plants that you're growing. Um, and then finally, which is the thing that, you know, everybody is talking about, especially in California, the whole Healthy Soils Initiative is that it sequesters carbon from the atmosphere. This one is a little bit different because um, if you want to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the soil, uh, when microbes consume it, they release part of that as CO2. Um, but it also provides a host of other benefits. And so when you're storing carbon in the soil, it's very often a balance between having it able to be used as microbial food, which increases microbial biomass and provides all these benefits and allows plants to grow bigger, or just having it stay there in the soil and have that carbon be locked. It's always sort of a give and take relationship. And so that's what a lot of research focuses on. And that's what we are like really um, interested in, at least myself. Um, the main sources of soil organic matter that you'd get in somewhere like a farm are above ground biomass. So anything leafy shoots, woody, crop residue, um, amendments such as manure and compost. Um, below ground biomass is a really big one. Roots, um, the carbon that goes into roots is very often um, easier for microbes to use. And root exudates, which are absolutely fascinating. Uh, if you don't know what root exudates are, you can think every plant basically secretes some cocktail of different sugars, which is, uh, if you want to think about why a diverse plant community would lead to a diverse microbial community, one of the reasons that happens is that every plant type secretes a different mix of sugars. They do that in order to attract microbes because they get a lot of benefits from having microbes associated with their roots. But if you have a diverse plant community, you have a lot of different compounds being released. And so you have a large diversity of microbes that'll be able to come in and you have a large, then you get more functions that is, it's more possible for them to carry out. Um, and so root exudates are like a really fascinating area of research as well. Um, so these microbes are what is responsible for taking that those residues and those leaves and sticks and shoots and compost and everything that we add and turning it into soil organic matter that can both, you know, a portion of it is used as, is important to leave a portion of it to be used as energy to allow that cycling to occur. And then a portion of it is locked away. Um, Within soil aggregates, if you go deeper in the soil where there aren't as many microbes, you can store more carbon there. Uh, but again, this idea of a balance between soil organic carbon as a place to store CO2 from the atmosphere and as a place uh, and as an energy source and nutrient source for the soil itself. Uh, and when you talk about microbes, the you know, one of the groups that's most important to talk about and that most people focus on um, are fungi. Uh, the reason that we like to focus on fungi is that very often fungi are the um, are one of the rate limiting steps. They're one of the guys that control how fast organic material is decomposed. When you think of wood, it's very difficult for wood to be decomposed. It's very hard. It's very tough. Um, that's because of a, a compound called lignin that makes up the majority of woody material. Fungi are one of the few organisms that um, secrete this cocktail of enzymes that can break down lignin. Um, I like to it's like a shotgun approach is that they just throw like every end they, they are, they're like so many enzymes that they just toss all of them at the lignin 
and until one of them sticks and is able to break it down. And then once that happens, other organisms such as bacteria um, and you know mites and stuff like that can come in and start to use that lignin that's been degraded as an uh, energy source. And so if you ever wonder why people are so focused on talking about soil fungi, uh, this is a really big reason that they're focused on the decomposition of organic matter to make it available to the wider soil community. And then um, finally, you have our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, AMF, uh, which are the coolest fungi in my opinion. They form this symbiosis with plant roots and they function as this uh, basically extra root system uh, as well as like nutrient finders. Um, and they're able to dissolve phosphorus bearing minerals. And so they're really important factor in getting phosphorus into plants. The symbiosis that they form with plant roots um, it means that they invade plant root cells and they form these structures inside the cells called arbuscules. And you can see a picture of them over here. Um, they look like trees, which is where they get their name from, arbuscules. But the plants provide carbon to the our mycorrhizal fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi act as an extra root system and they allow, um, they get minerals that the plant normally wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Uh, so how do we uh, manage for healthier microbes? Putting more carbon into the soil, um, organic carbon, you got compost, cover crops, crop residues, living roots are a really big one because you remember, as I mentioned, living roots are what provide those root exudates, which are sugars that you know um, are a really good food source for microbes. Another one is that you ensure that their houses stay intact. And so that's reducing disturbance and erosion. Um, a big one is keeping the soil covered to prevent against, to protect against erosion. And so that can be cover crops, that can be mulch. Um, but another really good one is the a smart timing and amount of tillage. Um, tillage is really useful as a weed control method. It's really useful in loosening up the soil for planting. Um, but when you till, you destroy, you destroy the soil structure. And so if you have a healthy soil, that structure can regenerate quickly. If you don't have a healthy soil, um, or if you till at the wrong time, anyone who's ever gone in and tilled right after it rained will be able to tell you what happens. The soil gets compacted. Um, all of that open space gets lost. And so there's nowhere for microbes to live. And you end up with these gigantic clods that will just be around for ages. Um, and that's something that you don't really want. So um, ensuring that you have smart timing, smart amount of tillage, keeping the soil covered are all really important factors. Um, I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm going too long, I'm gonna rush through the last part. Um, so it, to hammer it home a little bit more closely for um, the Solano RCD district, um, they mentioned they're putting in hedgerows. Um, the, the, again, these hedgerows bordering fields, uh, they can be variable widths. There's been a fair amount of research, especially from UC Davis on how these hedgerows Im impact soil biology. So again, the number one, you put plants in, you're gonna get more organic carbon. So very often these hedgerows will increase the amount of organic carbon in the soil, energy for microbes, and they're helping with climate change. They also increase the diversity of fungi and increase the amount of those arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, those little guys that, um, that I just mentioned that form the tree-like structures inside the plant cells. They help get nutrients, they help get phosphorus. Um, hedgerows help to promote those. They also increase the uh, amount of earthworms, which are also sure really good because they allow plant material, they help shred plant material, uh, increasing surface area, giving it more space for those enzymes to work on. Um, and their burrows aerate the soil. They provide that empty space, that poor network that microbes can live in. Riparian restoration, you're planting um, shrubs and trees uh, that you're uh, adding a diversity of shrubs and trees to replace maybe like they've been, the riversides have been deforested or there's like dominated by one particular species. Um, you put plants in, way more carbon and nitrogen uh, end up in the soil. Um, and there's more carbon stored in the trees themselves. Um, you get a lot more, there's a, when you have a diverse habitat of trees um, on a riverside, uh, it's storing more carbon than it would if you just, usually you just had like one, um, one type of tree. Uh, it does take time. So um, these, these 
benefits only showed up after about two years after the restoration was started. So you do have to wait a little bit longer, but again, it's the same concept, more carbon in the soil um, and a more diverse habitat is good for the microbes. And then the last one are the cover crops. Um, and you know, there are a lot of benefits to cover crops and I'm sure the Solano RCD uh, website as well as the Healthy Soils Initiative website can give you much more detailed information, but they're good for erosion control, improving nutrient content. Um, they're good for soil biota, not just microbes, but stuff like uh, larger things, earthworms, um, nematodes. Um, and they, in, they're really good at facilitating infiltration. Uh, and this is where my research comes in. So I um, cover crops are very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm really interested in them and you know what I have been working on in my PhD is I look at a combination of different practices, cover cropping, compost, mineral fertilizer, and I look at how this affects soil organic carbon and other nutrients after 25 years. Um, you, you know, it's not often that you get a chance to look at the long-term effects of these practices because it's really hard to keep a long-term experiment running. Um, and so when you do get the chance, it can show some really interesting results. Uh, what we found was that, um, so this graph is change in total carbon from 1993 to 2018. Um, everything on the right is an increase in soil carbon. Everything on the left is a decrease in soil carbon. And what, what we found is that a combination of cover crops and compost really increased soil carbon down to a meter after 25 years. While cover crops and mineral fertilizer, that's the blue one, didn't really have much of an effect. Um, and mineral fertilizer alone may have even had a little bit of a decrease. Um, I say cover crop and mineral fertilizer didn't really have a significant effect because my error bars overlap zero. And so, you know, we err on the side of caution and be like, that, that looks like it's not really an effect. Um, and so this is really interesting, right? Because when I look at this, my first question is why? Why does cover crop and compost increase soil carbon, but cover crop and mineral fertilizer does not? Because a cover crop is putting carbon in, it gets the roots, it's like has all of these root exudates, you'd expect that it would increase carbon a bit. Um, and so based, you know, we did some experiments where we did moisture measurements, hydraulic conductivity, nutrient content, microbial, um, uh, microbial community, and we have a working hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that cover crop roots are a source of carbon, but they also create a path. They create these, um, as the roots burrow down through the soil, they create these pores that when the roots die and decompose, those pores remain and it increases the amount of water that makes it deeper into the soil. Now, if you add water soluble nutrients such as nitrogen, um, that nitrogen is going to end up deeper in the soil. And we did find more nitrogen deeper in these cover crop and mineral fertilizer plots. But if you add compost, one of the things about compost is that it has a lot of water soluble carbon, nitrogen, and organic molecules that have phosphorus and sulfur that are fairly mobile. And so what happens is that all of that carbon ends up down there as well. So there's this synergistic effect between cover crops and water soluble nutrients that allow those water soluble nutrients to move deeper in the soil profile. And if one of those water soluble nutrients is carbon, you can increase carbon storage throughout the soil profile by a combination of these two practices. Um, and that's, that's our hypothesis and that paper is probably going to be published soon. So, um, so final thoughts, I hope I didn't go too over time. Um, so soil health and human health, very closely linked. Um, soil organic matter, carbon is the main energy source for soil microbes. We talk about fungi, they're really important for decomposition and getting nutrients. Um, and we can improve the health of soil microbes and by consequence, the health of the soil by reducing disturbance, adding living roots and adding organic carbon. And with that, um, this is a picture of Belize, uh, where I am right now, I was born and raised. And yeah, I'll, if you guys have any questions. Thanks, Daniel. That's super. Um, I do have two questions that came in uh, in our Q&A area. Um, the first is interesting link between the richness of local soil microbial activity and the human microbiome. And then the question is, 
do we know how the microbes get into the human body? Is it direct exposure to the soil or are the crops being eaten richer in those microbes? Uh, uh, that one I'm not entirely sure of. So you, there is evidence that the microbes remain on the crops, especially um, if you're, um, it's, it's more like the outside of the, of the crops, you know, if they come in contact with the soil. And even if you wash them, there's often like some microbes that like stay on it. Um, and so that could be one. I mean, um, every day, you know, there's a lot of soil that gets the dust gets blown around. We are constantly coming into contact with these microbes. The microbes you have in a particular location are often, you know, they have to have somewhere that they come from. Um, and so it could just be like throughout the day we come into contact with them regularly. Um, I don't know about microbes inside the fruit themselves. Um, that's I haven't seen any evidence about that. The one the stuff I have seen is sort of on the outside of the of the crops. Great. Um, we also have a question that came in when you had one of your hedgerow pictures up asking what the purple flowering shrub is. I think it, I think it was a Ceanothus um, species, a California lilac is the common name. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what we were looking at. Um, go with that. C-E-O-N, oh dear, C-E-O-N, C-E-O-N-O-T-H-U-S, Ceanothus species. Um, let's see, another question here. Do cover crops compete with the main perennial fruit or nut trees for nutrients? Um, yeah, I mean, if you have two plants in a particular location, there's probably going to be some competition for nutrients. Um, the nutrient, um, the it depends on what type of cover crop it is. So like, say you have a nitrogen fixing cover crop, that's not really going to be competing with anything for nitrogen because it produces its own nitrogen. And then that, um, that biomass just kind of gets plowed back into the soil. Um, cover crops, the, yeah, I, 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 it depends on, it really depends on what you plant. Um, and if you think about it, whatever nutrients go into a cover crop are gonna go back into the soil um, if you plow them in or if you put that residue there, if that residue is composted, that stuff is going to get added back in. So it's sort of like a temporary removal. Um, if, yeah, you can, it can extrapolate from that to like it, um, usually if the benefits that come from having the cover crop, keeping the soil protected and covered, infiltration and stuff like that, um, will likely outweigh like the small amount of competition that they would provide to root. I mean, perennial trees have like a huge root area as well. So they're probably pulling from a much wider area than cover crops are. Great. Uh, so we have a few more actually coming in the chat. I Some folks might not have heard at the beginning. We're trying to consolidate questions into the Q&A and not so much the chat, but that's okay. I can see both. Um, so one question over here is, a lot of research and literature recently about regenerative agricultural practices not necessarily being more carbon friendly than conventional ag because of land, like the number of acres needed to rotationally graze, et cetera. Thoughts? Yeah. Um, it depends. Yeah, I think I, I think it depends on specific practices as most things in life do. It always depends, comes down to the details. Um, I think that, I mean, personally, in my opinion, conventional agriculture, regenerative agriculture is, is kind of weird boxes to put stuff into. It's, you have these practices and we know, like for example, tillage, we know that tillage is useful for certain things. We know it's useful for reducing weed pressure. We know it's, we know it's useful for um, like increasing soil aeration and making it a little bit plant easier for smaller plant, younger plants to, spread their roots um it does that mean that you should till a lot no it's like a smart amount of tillage um the same thing with regenerative agriculture carbon friendly practices um i think that it depends on the soil that you're in depends on the climate that you're in um mineral fertilizer is not necessarily always a bad thing um no till is not always a good thing um it sort of depends on like what the what the conditions of your soil are um, to begin with. Um, when it comes specifically to grazing, I do not have much experience in uh, grazing. 
uh, like grazing practices. I mostly focus on sort of compost and cover crops, uh, tillage and stuff like that. But these integrated, li you're right, these integrated livestock systems are getting a lot more attention um, recently. Great. Um, let's see, we have a few more questions coming in, but we're getting close to the 11 o'clock hour when we're planning to take a break. So I'll end with one more and then the other three questions I have here, I'll make sure they get to your email and you can respond directly. Um, last question I'll read right now is, does organic fertilizer like fish emulsion, bone meal, blood meal act the same as mineral fertilizers? If you know. Uh, act the same as mineral fertilizers. Are they methods of putting nutrients into the soil? Yes. Um, do they have a large amount of soluble nutrients? In I would imagine in many cases, yes. Um, I mean, yeah, mineral fertilizer, is there ammonia? Like, you know, in some places they put cow urine um, on the field as like a fertilizer. That's urea, which is kind of close to mineral fertilizers. Um, and so uh, does it act the same? I'm not entirely sure. It definitely does something that many mineral fertilizers do not in that it adds carbon as well as other nutrients. Um, when you add uh, nitrogen, um, the soil microbes will take the carbon from the soil in order to match the amount of nitrogen that's available. And so you can, a lot of cases, you can get carbon depletion um, because the soil microbes are constantly having nitrogen added and they're constantly hunting down carbon, but there's not a lot of carbon being added in. And so one of the main things that stuff like bone meal and blood meal and fish emulsion, all these things do, they add nutrients, but adding carbon is like one of the big things. That is a, that makes sense. Thank you, Daniel. Um, okay, so we will end there for now. We're gonna take a 10 minute break. Uh, quickly though, I will also mention that somebody loved your um, microbial art. <laughs> and oh, go ahead. Online. Oh, it's it's not mine. I I, I have oh. her her yeah. thing there, and I can stick it in the chat. But it's a beautiful art. I love it. You shared. Um, and I will also just go back to a question that came in for Amy as to whether or not the hedgerows are going to be irrigated. Which I typed the answer, but just so everyone can hear they're going to be drip irrigated. Amy, if you wanted to say more, go ahead. Oh, sure, yeah, no, they'll be drip irrigated um, and on a timer, we have an absolutely beautiful water system out there and then heavily mulched. I, I should have mentioned that. How we're gonna deal with kind of the understory and weeds and moisture retention is with about four inches of wood chip mulch. Super, all right, everybody. Um, these have been fantastic presentations so far. Thank you. I'm gonna put up our 10 minute break slide. So. Um, we will come back at about 12 minutes past 11, and we will be hearing from Jessica K. Cruz with the Xerces Society about pollinators. All right, welcome back um, everyone to our webinar. Our next presenter is Jessica Cruz with the Xerces Society. Um, hi, Jessa, I know you're ready. <laughs> um, so I think we will go ahead and get started. We're just right on time, 11.13. So hopefully everybody managed to 
um, take a break and get what you needed. And we can now enjoy Jessa's presentation about pollinators and beneficial insects. Thanks, Jessa. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. Um, I think I'm having some trouble with my screen share. It looks like maybe you guys are not seeing the right view, or are you? Um, let's see. So if any of the, I see, Jessa, a view that has the next slide listed to the right, as well as the main slide to the left. So it's not the, sh the slideshow view. Um, That's what I'm worried about. If the attendees can put into the chat window, if you see a full screen view or a view with the next slide, that would be helpful. I cannot get this to swap. Let's see. We're saying, they're saying they see the next slide view. Yeah, okay, let me, um, I'm gonna shut this all down. Okay. And try again. Uh, so I think, yeah, I don't know what's going on. While you're doing that, I'm gonna just throw a question out to Daniel that we didn't have time for. Um, and that was because we have, um, so we can get back to folks. And I think what we may end up doing is putting a Q and A um, document in our workshops and events page of a few questions that weren't gotten to. Um, but one came in from an anonymous questioner so that we, we wouldn't be able to email you. Uh, Daniel, do you know of any grape varietals or this could also perhaps be for Amy that don't do well due to cover crop competition? Or does it always depend on the type of cover crop and varietal plantings? So are there any specific great varietals that you are aware of that, um, that are, you know, it's, if I have a detrimental relationship because of competition with cover crops? I don't really know much about great varietals, unfortunately. So um, yeah, I don't know if Amy has an idea. Um, I, I'm not a varietal expert either, but I, I have heard rumors that um, rootstock would make the, the biggest difference and that sometimes people do pair um, cover crop mixes with particular rootstock, um, but which ones I, I do not know. <laughs> who do, who, can you think, Amy, off the top of your head, who we would refer somebody to with that? that yeah, that, that would really be a, like a, a CCA a question for a, a certified crop advisor or um, you know, possibly a cooperative extension. Okay, um, and I will make sure sometime within the next week or so that we can post some links on our Solano Healthy Soils website that could point you to um, hopefully somebody with some expertise in grape varietals. Hi, Jessa, how's it going? I, I looks like we still have the next slide view. I mean, I can see your slide. Would, um, Oh, there it is. There it is. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So now I can't see my slides, but I'm just going to go for it and hopefully it's all going to work out. Sorry about that. It was working fine when we tested it, of course. Um, so my name is Jessica Cruz and I'm going to be talking about creating on farm habitat for pollinators and for other beneficial insects. Um, I am the senior pollinator conservation specialist with the Xerces Society based out of Sacramento, um, or I am based out of Sacramento. The Xerces Society is a national organization. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, the Xerces Society works to protect biodiversity through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. Um, we've been around for about 50 years um, and we were named after the Xerces blue butterfly um, that you see pictured here, which is one of the uh, first invertebrates to go um, extinct due to human encroachment and human activity. Um, and it really uh, highlighted the need for conservation efforts um, that were targeted specifically at invertebrates. Um, at Xerces Society, our motto is protecting the life that sustains us, um, which is our way of saying that um, we need invertebrates as much as they need us, um, from pollinators to natural enemies to detritivores. We're really dependent on the ecosystem services um, that insects provide both in our natural systems and our, our natural ecosystems, as well as in our agricultural systems. Um, 
talking specifically about pollinators now, um, the importance of pollinators and the roles that they play in our natural ecosystems, um, about 85% of the flowering plants require an animal to move pollen and thus to reproduce, to be able to, um, to set seed. In our food systems, pollinators are obviously really critical. You've probably all heard this statistic by now that about one in every three bites of food that we eat required uh, in insect pollination, um, which comes out to um, up to $30 billion a year in crop value in the United States. Um, no less important, although maybe less well known or with less talked about would be the value of our natural enemies. Um, so these would be our, um, our natural enemies of crop pests, um, insects that prey on crop pests or parasitized crop pests. This would include parasitic wasps, predatory ground beetles, uh, predatory wasps, um, lady beetles, lace wings, and all of these insects have very similar habitat requirements to pollinators and thus creating habitat for pollinators also um, supports these natural enemy populations. As a lot of you have probably been hearing about these severe declines, sort of uh, insect population declines worldwide um, over the last 50, um, over the last 75 years, we have lost an average of about 50% of our insect populations across the board. More specifically, talking about pollinators and pollinator declines, um, about 28% of, of our bumblebee species are currently threatened. 17% uh, of North American butterfly species are classified as at risk. And as I think everybody has probably heard, the Western monarch population has been absolutely decimated. There's been about a 99.9% .9 decline in the last several decades. So we have gone from hundreds of thousands, um, even over a million monarch butterflies um, in the West to less than 2,000 counted um, this year as of the 2020 uh, monarch, Western monarch Thanksgiving count. So really dire story um, with the Western monarchs, which Sarah's going to talk a little more about. Um, one of the things about these insect declines that I think is particularly alarming is that these declines include uh, not only our habitat specialists, um, which tend to kind of be the most vulnerable um, to declines, but also these formerly common um, and really wide species like the monarch butterfly. Um, and that is, I think, particularly alarming. There's a number of factors um, contributing to pollinator declines. And it's important to keep in mind that all of these factors are sort of interacting with each other. Um, so we've got habitat loss or habitat degradation, which is really the focus of what I'll be talking about um, today. But in terms of habitat loss, uh, not only have we lost uh, natural areas at an alarming rate, um, but also there's just been a general degradation of these areas and farmscapes um, that once were really um, diverse uh, are now really limited um, in terms of habitat. I'm sorry, hold on one second. Um, we've also got declines in, uh, or we've also got pesticides really playing a role in pollinator declines. Um, and this is really um, an issue across the board, both in agricultural landscapes as well as um, other landscapes. Um, and then we've got climate change really playing a role in um, uh, pollinator declines across the board in a lot of different ways. And I won't have time really to go into the details of the, the pollinator declines today, but it's important to keep those in the back of your mind as we're talking. Um, today, we're going to be focused mostly on the habitat piece of things. Um, but again, just remembering the role of pesticides and the role of climate change um, sort of overarching everything as we talk about habitat. What's great um, about habitat on farms is that I really look at it as a win-win. It's a way 
for farmers um, and ranchers to be part of the solution by helping these declining pollinator populations. Um, and it's also a way for farms to get ecosystem services from these insects, such as crop pollination, or such as increasing natural enemy populations um, that are going to contribute to natural pest control on a farm. So why is habitat valuable? What, what is it about habitat that what does it provide for insects and how does it function? Um, primarily habitat provides food um, in the form of pollen and nectar. Pollen and nectar make up about 100% of a bee's diet and also provides um, a really important food source for um, natural enemies. Um, to either supplement their diet or at very specific times of their life cycle. Um, so again, food sources, flowering plants, pollen and nectar being really critical for um, all of these different beneficial insect communities. Um, habitat also provides shelter, um, primarily uh, nesting um, areas, as well as overwintering, uh, overwintering sites and protected areas um, for these different insect communities. They provide a refuge from pesticides, um, as well when managed properly. And we have a lot of different studies that, have, that show a really direct link between habitat and beneficial insect um, communities, beneficial insect um, abundance and diversity. Um, so when I say beneficial insects, I'm talking both about pollinators as well as about natural enemies. Um, and I have a couple of my own data slides that I'll share sort of toward the end of this presentation. Thinking about sort of creating habitat um, on your farm, we've sort of talked about some of these different habitat features, um, but I just wanted to kind of provide an overview to get people thinking about, you know, what might work um, on your own farm or on your own ranch um, or whatever working land you might be managing. Um, hedgerows, I think, are probably the I would say maybe the easiest to um, create or install, and that doesn't mean they're easy. Um, but I think it's maybe one of the more straightforward types of habitat to create um, and also one of the most long lasting in terms of creating really um, high value long term habitat. Um, so hedgerows in general would include um, flowering plants, um, I'm sorry, flowering shrubs, sometimes trees if they're spaced and also smaller herbaceous plants. It's important to provide multiple bloom periods or plants that bloom at different times of the year. So if you've got something blooming from spring all the way through to the fall. Um, hedgerows also provide nesting habitat um, and overwintering habitat, especially if they include things like bunch grasses um, or low growing shrubs that provide some shelter um, for nesting and for overwintering. It is important to protect these areas from pesticides we generally recommend a 40 to 60 foot buffer or more, um, just depending on what is happening um, in adjacent land use in terms of pesticide use. Um, some pesticides are obviously much more problematic than others. Um, for hedgerows, some irrigation is required. We generally recommend installing drip irrigation um, when you're working, you know, and, and also planting hedgerows in the fall to take advantage of the um, seasonal rains. Um, and then maybe irrigating your hedgerow for the first two or three years while it's getting established. And eventually it can come off irrigation except in times of like severe droughts. Um, hedgerows also provide multiple benefits. Um, we talked a little bit about some of these benefits already, but just keeping in mind things like screening out wind or dust, sequestering carbon, uh, and providing seeds and berries for fruit um, or for birds and for other types of wildlife. Um, we have some plant lists, and I'm going to share a link at the end of this presentation, but we do have some uh, plant lists on our website to help people um, with plant selection for hedgerows and other types of plantings. Um, also, there are field borders um, or insectary strips, as we call them. This is generally comprised of herbaceous plants and wildflowers. Um, and they can be pretty narrow and still be functional. So it's useful to plant these insectary strips in areas maybe where you don't have enough, enough width for a hedgerow um, for shrubby plants. Um, so it could be a, you know, a field edge or farm road, um, equipment yards, just any kind of odd spaces um, that where you might not have room for larger plants. 
Um, as with hedgerows, it's really important to protect these areas from pesticides. Um, and the irrigation requirements are kind of variable. Um, if you plant by seed in the fall and we have a decent rainfall year, um, these kinds of, and you're, you're using drought tolerant native plants, native wildflowers, um, these types of habitats can generally um, be established um, without irrigation. But if you're using transplants um, or if we have a drought year, which we have plenty of, um, you know, some irrigation again is recommended. Um, and as with our hedgerows, we have not just plantless, but also some specific seed mix recommendations on our website. And so I'll share that link again with you toward the end of this presentation. There's also cover cropping, which I know we've talked a little bit about, certainly has tremendous soil health benefits. Um, cover cropping can be seasonal um, or it could be um, a permanent understory uh, in a perennial cropping system like an orchard or a vineyard just depending on what the management requirements are um, of the surrounding cropped area. Um, the important thing, if you're thinking about cover cropping for, um, for pollinators or for beneficial insects um, in general, so like I call that insectary cover cropping, um, if you want that to be one of the benefits as well as the soil health benefits, it's important to let things bloom for as long as possible. Um, people, in California generally think about terminating their cover crops early in the season. So they grow them as kind of a cool season um, thing and then would terminate them uh, in the spring. But if you want to build up good populations of beneficial insects or pollinators, you wanna let it bloom for as long as possible because those populations of those insects are just starting to get going in the spring. I generally recommend a mix of um, some more traditional cover crop species like brassicas or clovers um, combined with legumes and native wildflowers. Um, again, we have some specific cover crop mix recommendations on our website. Cover cropping is generally uh, non-irrigated um, just because irrigation is not usually available, at least in a perennial cropping system if you're um, you know, in between the rows. Um, certainly if you can irrigate, your things are probably gonna bloom better and longer. Um, but again, if you seed in the fall and we have some decent um, seasonal rain, you should be able to get a pretty good stand of cover crops, even in a non-irrigated situation. Um, in terms of protection from pesticides, obviously those 40 to 60 foot buffers um, aren't going to be possible, um, especially if you're thinking about cover cropping as an understory in a perennial system. Um, so in those cases, we recommend mowing the cover crop down if it's blooming and you do need to spray with something that could be toxic to pollinators. Um, and I do have a website to share as well called Be Better Precaution that's um, run by UCIPM that has really good information um, about pesticide um, um, toxicity to pollinators. And I also wanted to mention kind of a less well-known habitat feature um, that we refer to as beetle banks. So beetle banks are um, permanent native grass strips um, that are designed um, as habitat specifically for predaceous ground beetles. So these are beetles that are natural enemies of a lot of crop pests. They will prey on pest beetles, um, slugs. They will um, also prey on lepidopteran pests, so you know caterpillars. Um, and that is the habitat that they like. They nest and burrow down in um, underneath bunch grasses. Um, so they can be great uh, natural pest control and, and creating a beetle bank is a really great way to pull in those predaceous ground beetles. Also just, I wanted to mention because I know a lot of times when I talk about this 40 to 60 foot uh, recommended buffer between you know any sprayed areas and any habitat areas, that can be really, really challenging in agricultural systems where the value of land is really high and we just don't have space for that kind of just a spatial buffer. So one option is to create a vegetative drift barrier. This is an example of a drift barrier from a project that we did in a vineyard. And you can see, hopefully you can see my mouse, but we've got the um, vineyard here and then we've got this habitat kind of on this hillside, um, only maybe 15 feet or so away from the vineyard. And so in the middle here, we've planted this linear row 
um, of conifers. Uh, I think these are Italian cypress. Um, and conifers are really good to use as vegetative drift barriers because they're not generally very attractive to most types of wildlife or pollinators. Um, and the needles are really good at, at catching drift. Um, so that can be one option um, for protecting your habitat areas from possible you know, pesticide contamination. As I mentioned, um, I wanted to just share a couple of um, data slides from a project I did. Um, this was in cover crop areas on a number of different um, farms throughout California. And we looked at uh, pollinator and natural enemy populations in the cover crop areas compared to non-cover crop control sites on the same farm. Um, and we looked at a, a handful of these pretty easy to find and recognize um, beneficial insects like predaceous wasps, serpent flies, lacewings, lady beetles, et cetera. Um, and oh, the MPG, just so you know, is a minute um, pirate bug. Um, there are, so like after two years of data collection, we found about 14 times the number of natural enemies in our cover cropped areas um, as compared to the control sites. Uh, and then when we added in um, some of our pollinator populations like native bees and honeybees, uh, and serpent flies, which are both pollinators and natural enemies, um, we found about 28 times um, the number of beneficial insects in our cover crop areas as compared to our control sites. So again, just demonstrating this is not publishable data um, or published data, um, but again, just demonstrating um, the efficacy of these types of habitats really pulling in these beneficial insect populations. I mentioned that I would share some additional resources for you um, um, if Andrea or I can after um, I'm done presenting, I can cut and paste these links um, into um, the Q&A just so people have them. But um, our pollinator conservation, oops, sorry, our pollinator conservation resource center, um, this is the link for it right here. That's where you would find our plant lists, um, some of the recommended seed mixes that I mentioned, um, some guidance, some very specific guidance for creating these different types of habitat, how to get it in the ground and how to manage it and that kind of thing. Um, the other resource that I mentioned was Be Precaution. It's a really user-friendly website where you can query specific pesticide pro products that are out on the market and look at their toxicity rating. Um, all of the rating is done for honeybees um, because that's just how the, that's where the research is. Um, but you can extrapolate that same data for pretty much any kind of native bee as well, um, as, as well as some of our natural enemy population. So it's a good guide to use. Um, and then of course the UC IPM general website just has great information on pest management. Um, at some natural pest management and biological pest management options. And just to share some final thoughts with folks, um, as the single largest land use on earth, um, farming is really critical to the future of biodiversity. Um, but also I would say that biodiversity is really critical to the future of farming. Um, having biodiversity on your farm really can help you create um, a, a sustainable and healthy um, farming system um, that I think really is the way of the future. So that is all I have for you at the moment. Um, I can go ahead, I think, and take some questions if there are some. Thank you, Jessa. Um, we have one question here that is, how often should wildlife habitats be readdressed or replanted? Is there a benefit to letting natural processes take over? Um, I would say that it really depends on, um, it's a really case by case situation. If you have good initial establishment, um, you should not have to do a lot of replanting of, of permanent perennial plants like hedgerows, for example. Um, I always overplant a little bit. We're going to have some natural attrition. Not everything is going to survive. But if you've got 70 to 80% survivorship, you're doing pretty good. 
Um, now with wildflowers um, and cover crops, a little bit of a different story, even our permanent wildflower plantings don't last forever. It's not exactly a natural system. Um, so over time, you may have to replant um, wildflower areas. You can interseed um, in the winter, which just means mowing everything down and then without tearing everything up, going in and just seeding into what you've already got. Um, or if you've got, you know, very little left, or if you have really big weed problems, you might have to tear the whole thing out and start over. Um, but again, if you have good initial establishment, you should not have to do that. Um, and I will take a, a moment to say that site preparation is critical and it is the single most important determining factor I, in my experience, maybe next to irrigation, um, in terms of project success. So you want to start, if you know you want to do a project and you want to plant, I recommend starting almost a year in advance and just starting to manage the weeds in an area before you put anything in the ground. Um, and you'll be a lot better off, uh, generally speaking. Great. Um, and then I will also go back to a question that came in after Daniel's presentation, but you, Daniel answered, um, he typed an answer and I thought maybe he might want to go ahead and answer verbally or Jessa, you might have some input. Um, the question was about thoughts on using cover crops in hot and dry climate. I, I imagine both weather cover crops um, can be suited to that and also using water for that purpose, um, how that, I guess, maybe the, the ecological benefit versus the cost of using extra water. So if you guys want to um, chime in on that, that'd be great. That's a great question and something I've thought a lot about. So I'll say a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, I have done a lot of cover cropping in the Central Valley, which is pretty hot and dry. Um, and my recommendation, and this is part of the reason that I do recommend this, is to include um, some native wildflowers. Um, our native wildflowers are extremely drought tolerant. They're adapted to this climate, and there are years where, when when I planted cover crops in during some of our more severe drought years in like 2013 or 2014, back back during that 60 year drought. Um, the native wildflowers were really the only thing that did well and they did fine we had some things that were blooming even with our you know pitiful six inches of rain or less that we got that year um the other thing is i know people often express concern about cover crops sort of taking water away from cropped areas um there is a lot of research emerging on that topic that generally is not the case um, cover crops don't tend to use a ton of water. Some of it is about where you plant them and how you manage them. The one real benefit or one of the benefits of cover crops when it comes to soil moisture is just that they vastly improve uh, water infiltration, which keeps the water where you need it and keeps it from running off the field. So it can actually be a um, soil moisture benefit. Um, and then I guess if, if other speakers have something to add, I can pause for a minute and, and see if anybody wants to chime in. Daniel, I see you have a typed answer here. Um, do you want to go ahead and respond? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I primarily work with um, cover crops and agricultural systems. And so it's usually stuff like veg and bell beans and Austrian beans. Um, and with those, they usually do require water uh, irrigation, but we usually do them during the winter. So it's less of an issue. Um, I, yeah, I think that it, there is research that's saying that the benefits you get from cover crops can outweigh um, the, the, the amount of water that they do use up. Um, like, just as said, with infiltration, increases in soil organic matter, increases in soil water holding capacity. Um, but yeah, I think, um, like you said, it's sort of a case by case basis on sort of where you are. If you're somewhere in the middle of the desert, um, uh, you know, and they doing native flowers and native shrubs would probably, I can see that that would be a much more attractive version than trying to bring in stuff like um, vetch or that might need a little bit more water. 
Right. Yeah, I would have just one comment real quick, which was that um, I think some of it's kind of a longer term um, outlook and that that does include some inherent risk as you as you're trying to manage year to year, but the increase in soil organic matter um, that it can bring to soils that need it can be a really substantial um, improvement in soil water holding capacity over time that would overall be be awfully beneficial. Thanks, Amy. Um, and let's see. There, we don't have any other open questions right now. I will also point out that in the chat, somebody asked about how to find the publication that Daniel referred to um, that's upcoming. And um, so he said that he will provide, well, we'll provide his email at the end of the webinar today. And you can always email him and he can send it to you or run a Google Scholar alert search for Daniel Raff, and it will send you to an email when it comes out. Um, oh, and it will be in an open source journal, so there shouldn't be, you wouldn't need to pay for it. Um, I think that looks like all the questions we have right now. Um, so with that, I think we can move to Sarah's presentation focused on monarchs. Uh, Sarah, hmm. Sarah. Amy, do you see Sarah? It looks I'm like here. You're there. Good. <laughs> I just, I'm not sharing my screen. Okay. That's um, good. I was a little concerned. I didn't see your camera. Um, no. okay, great. Are you, are you ready? Yeah. Um, let me just uh, try to figure out how to share my screen. Um, seems to be totally different in this version of PowerPoint. Okay. So do you see the title slide? Do. Pardon? We, yep, we see it. Uh, awesome. Um, so one of the, first of all, my name is Sarah McKibben. I work for Solana Resource Conservation District. Um, I'm one of the restoration project managers there and am currently managing a project, a grant funded project um, that's funded by the Wildlife Conservation Board. And it's in partnership with the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. <laughs> Um, a lot of acronyms, but uh, in any case, um, this grant focuses on um, pollinators in general, but particularly monarch um, conservation. Um, we have a demonstration garden being installed at our uh, equipment yard in Vacaville. Um, and generally, initially the idea was to have a bunch of workshops and, and, and plant sales at our yard, um, but uh, those have been put on hold for a while. Um, we've taken it online, obviously. Um, and then the other part of it is a technical assistance portion of the grant where I'm trying to do you know, webinars like this and um, be able to answer questions uh, to landowners and try to connect them with resources uh, so that they can uh, hopefully install habitat to support monarchs or just do what they can to support monarchs in general. Um, one of the downsides to going last is I think most of my presentation has already been presented to some degree, but there is there is some new um, information in here. But um, in any case, uh, I just wanted to start off with the life cycle of monarchs, just to kind of give you a little bit of background. Um, as many of you might already know, um, monarchs are completely dependent on milkweed plants um, for part of their, um, or for their life cycle. Um, it, of course, now my notes are not showing up. Ah, there they are. Okay. Um, they obviously, they lay their eggs on milkweed plants and the um, eggs hatch out into the larva or the caterpillars. Um, and they go through five instar stages, um, which is basically just stages in which they molt and get bigger with each molting. Um, and so milkweed plants provide uh, shelter and food for these larvae um, and the toxins in milkweed help protect them from predators to some degree. Um, the stems are also used to uh, hold the chrysalis um, which is the pupa, uh, the third picture from the left, um, while they uh, metamorphosize <laughs> into the final uh, monarch butterfly. And at that point, it uses 
milkweed plant as a nectar source. Um, and milkweed in general is an, actually a very important nectar source for lots of other pollinators in general. Um, so this life cycle repeats about four to five times throughout the breeding and migration um, season, uh, which is generally spring through fall. Um, and each cycle generally lasts about four weeks, um, except for the last one, which the last, uh, the last butterfly, I guess, um, of that life cycle, the last generation, is the one that migrates to um, its overwintering grounds. Um, and those depend on, uh, their, their overwintering sites depend on which population um, to which they belong. So, and I'll go over that in a moment, but um, overall what monarchs need um, in their breeding and migratory habitat is obviously native milkweed. Uh, it's especially important for it to be our native varieties. I know it's unfortunately more easy to get non-native varieties of milkweed at most of your big box stores and, and local nurseries. Um, but no, native milkweed in particular is especially important for them. Uh, flowering nectar plants, just like all pollinators, need to be available all through um, their breeding season and all throughout their uh, breeding habitat range. And then their overwintering habitat usually consists of pines and eucalyptus trees along the California coast. Oh my goodness, I haven't even changed the slide. Here you go, this will help. <laughs> um, uh, the western population of monarchs is, uh, depend on the pines and eucalyptus trees of California. Um, and then there's an eastern population. They migrate down to Mexico and generally use the uh, OML fir forests. And then all throughout their overwintering, habitat, they still need nectar sources available to maintain their energy stores, uh, as well as a clean water drinking source. Um, so this is a general overview of their migration patterns in the United States. So generally west of the Rockies um, is the considered the western population of monarchs. And they overwinter along the coast. Um, it's the dark red area. I don't know if you can see my mouse on this, but um, all along the California coast um, is where they overwinter. Typically, like I said, in, in eucalyptus trees and pines. And then all throughout spring and summer, um, they are more inland, uh, you know, searching for milkweed plants and, and nectar sources as well. And then east of the Rockies generally is the eastern population and they overwinter, migrate and overwinter in Mexico. Um, so as has been mentioned, the population of the Western monarchs in particular has declined significantly. So uh, in the 1980s, it was estimated that four and a half million monarchs were overwintering along the Pacific coast. Um, and I don't know if any of you have actually been able to go to like Pismo Beach or any of the overwintering sites that still remain, but uh, in previous years, they had just been clusters dangling from typically eucalyptus trees and it's just absolutely stunning. Um, but unfortunately throughout um, the past few decades, their population has declined significantly. Um, this is uh, the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count that's been um, conducted since 1997 with the Xerxes Society. Um, and even since 1997 alone, you could see that there was over a million uh, monarchs of the wintering along the coast. But in the past three years in particular has been a, a drastic decline um, from under 30,000 to just under 2,000 uh, this past winter. So. It's, um, it, it's, it's fairly depressing. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but um, I'm sure that's how a lot of us feel as it is. Um, so why are they declining? Um, one, of the, one of the largest uh, issues is a loss of overwintering habitat. Um, a lot of development along the coast has displaced their overwintering groves, as well as a lot of them have just declined with age and there is little to no regeneration. 
Um, their breeding habitat has been replaced with urban sprawl and um, agricultural methods that include extensive tilling and pesticide use, which um, displace milkweed and um, nectar plants in general. Um, extensive pesticide use for mosquito control and even as small as homeowner use um, and the nursery trade is, uh, has been very impactful. Um, there's actually a new study that was just released in 19, or 19, uh, 2020. Um, it's, I think it was in the frontiers in ecology and evolution. Um, it showed that milkweed throughout the central California was contaminated with over, I believe it was 64 different pesticides. Um, and on average, milkweed plants um, had nine different pesticides up to up to, and up to 25 different types of pesticides contaminating their leaves. Um, some of them, some of the samples actually contained doses that would be lethal to, um, to, uh, to the larva. Um, pesticides also have been um, used extensively in genetically modified crops, crop systems, um, crops that are modified to resist herbicides. So it allows for just broadcast blanket spraying of fields um, with herbicides to combat weeds and leave almost nothing besides the crop itself. And so farm edges and ditches are kind of collateral damage and that's usually where milkweed would naturally grow. So just in general, pesticides have just de helped decrease habitat availability. Um, another one that is a little bit, a little more, um, obscure is uh, the plant pe people using tropical milkweed. That is one of the most common milkweeds that you can find um, at local nurseries. It is very pretty, uh, but one of the issues with it is it doesn't go dormant in the winter like our native milkweeds do. So it, it hosts um, a protozoan parasite um, called OE, I'm not gonna even try to pronounce it, but right now, but um, what it does is when uh, larvae are eating the, the leaves, they are accumulating this protozoan parasite and it, uh, it just affects their reproductive fitness and reduces their chances of successfully migrating and even just um, forming the, um, sorry, they become deformed essentially. So, but be, with our native milkweeds, because they go dormant in the winter, it just sort of resets, it, it disperses the spores and there's just not as much of a, a load of this OE parasite. Um, so our California native milkweed species, the two most common for our region are narrow, narrow leaf milkweed and showy milkweed. Um, they are just the most adapted to our type of soils and climate. Um, there are several other species that are native to California, but they tend to be found um, in rockier sites or have different um, climate regimes or, or, or needs. So um, if you're going to try to plant milkweed, um, which is one of the best things you can do to help monarchs, uh, I would definitely look primarily for narrow leaf milkweed or showy milkweed. Um, you can actually find uh, native milkweed seed through Zer the Xerxes Society website. Um, they have a milkweed seed finder. Um, it, while they can be um, established from seed, it is generally easier to plant them from plugs and rhizomes. Um, and there are um, local nurseries, uh, Hedro Farms in particular, is one that sells small plugs and rhizomes um, for the, our native milkweeds. Um, in general, if you can plant them in larger stands, it's better habitat for monarchs um, because the caterpillars actually, the larvae actually decimate the individual plants. So they need to be able to crawl over to the next plant over to uh, decimate that one. Um, so they just need to have enough forage available for them to complete their life cycle. So having 
at least 10 plants, um, ideally the same species is sort of a minimum number clustered together is a, a good way to go if you're gonna try to plant milkweed. Um, one exception to planting milkweed is uh, to avoid planting it within five miles of the coast. Um, that is, as mentioned before, their overwintering site and it uh, may interfere with their overwintering diapause um, and it, it just might trigger them to breed and it's just not with outside of their the plant's historical range. So just in general, we avoid, um, it's advised to avoid planting within five miles of the coast. Um, and one um, kind of misnomer, I guess, with, with milkweed is it is, while it is toxic to um, animals, that a lot of uh, ranchers are concerned with allowing milkweed to grow within their rangelands um, because it is toxic to cattle. But generally, it's it has to be consumed in extensive quantities. And if there is other forage available, it is generally avoided. Um, there haven't been any recently reported deaths to USDA uh, due to milkweed poisoning. Um, also very important are other nectar sources um, mixed in with our native milkweed plantings. Um, on the right are some of the plant lists that uh, I believe Jessa was, was uh, referring to that we found on the Zeus Society website. Um, they, uh, generally, if you're going to plant nectar sources, ideally you have a broad diversity so that you have year round bloom. Um, some of the best, like one of the best species, for example, is like coyote bush because it blooms in a time of year where almost nothing else is blooming. Um, so trying to achieve something flowering year round is ideal. Um, protect that habitat from pesticides, as mentioned before. And I also stumbled across a, I don't really know what else to call it, but besides the 10, 10, 10, 10, one rule, which uh, if you're going to plant habitat for monarchs, at a minimum, ideally you plant a 10 by 10, 10 foot by 10 foot area, um, which would include at least 10 milkweed plants um, of the same species, maybe a diversity, maybe one or two. Um, and uh, having 10 different plant species total, um, again, trying to achieve a, a broad range of bloom bloom periods. And then each species you want to have about a square meter grouped into blocks or chunks so that they're um, not individually scattered everywhere. Um, it's generally better if they're in a little bit more clumps. And so again, this is sort of a minimum, um, mostly to help landowners if uh, they don't have much room to work with. But uh, if you have more, then definitely uh, I would scale it up. <laughs> Um, here's another plant list that I've come across, and this is just one of my favorites to uh, share with people because it, it so clearly defines a, plants that grow very easily, are generally easy to find, and give you a range of when they're going to be blooming. Um, so there, there's just a lot of resources. Dersey Society obviously is, is one of the largest ones, um, and, and just in terms of having Lots of resources for anywhere from landowners to um, farmers to just small scale um, homeowners is, is very helpful. Um, other ways you can generally help avoiding pesticide use yet again. Um, systemic insecticides are the worst. They, they can persist for much longer than you would expect. Um, and in, for that same reason, it's exercising your purchase power. Um, so even when you purchase buying plants from nursery stock, there are some uh, brands that are starting to tout how they avoid using neonicotinoid use. Um, it's one of the more common uh, systemic insecticides that um, affect honeybees in particular. Um, so trying to look for those labels that um, tout not using um, neonicotinoids. And then also um, organic produce um, or non-GMO produce, it, it doesn't 
seem like a lot perhaps, but it's just driving the market for the produce that's, um, or for farming practices that are going to avoid um, inadvertently impacting mo monarchs and pollinators as a whole. Um, protecting overwintering sites. This one is uh, a little more different difficult to achieve, um, just becoming an advocate, contacting your, your local um, politicians, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, you can find overwintering sites on westernmonarchcount.org. It's a really nice interactive map of all of the existing um, and, and past um, overwintering sites on the California coast. And also, um, it gives you a history of previous counts um, for every uh, Thanksgiving count that's been reported. Um, there also are opportunities to volunteer for citizen science projects. Um, every spring, there's a usually a call to report observations of, of monarchs so that there's um, a better, uh, I, I guess, um, more evidence or, or understanding of where monarchs go and the type of habitat, habitat they're using in the spring um, during the breeding season. Uh, you can report those through Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. And then um, you actually can volunteer with the Thanksgiving and New York New Year's counts. Um, there are, is some training involved, but uh, um, it is a, definitely an interesting way to, uh, to be involved. And then of course you can always donate to um, the local nonprofits that try to protect all these species. Uh, general programs that can help. There are lots of programs that can help, but I just tried to find ones that I know have funding now. Um, one of the main ones um, that I always come across is uh, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, they have several different programs to choose from. Um, it, all their programs are generally geared towards um, growers and large scale landowners. Um, but even on small scale farms, as long as you're you know, producing, there, there's a little more flexibility with um, who is qualified. So it, it would definitely be worth contacting your, your NRCS office for more information. But um, some of the most common programs are EQIP. Um, that one is uh, based on practices, individual practices that you can do. And it's, it's basically a cost share uh, program and um, which helps, helps you, helps landowners install habitat. Um, there's also the, um, sorry. There's a conservation stewardship program, um, and that's it, mostly for landowners that already have existing NRCS uh, systems in place, um, but to enhance the existing habitat that they have. Um, and then there's an agricultural conservation easement program that um, if you have, if you're a landowner that um, particularly has wetlands on their property or riparian habitat with long waterways, um, you can, place them in easements uh, through NRCS. Um, yeah. um, and then another one I've recently been working with or speaking to is uh, Project APIS M. Um, it's usually targeted towards honeybee and beekeepers, um, honeybees and beekeepers support. Um, but they have one program, it's called Seeds for Bees, and it provides funding for um, purchasing cover crop seeds for landowners and growers. Um, most commonly, this is awarded to um, almond orchards because honeybees are the primary pollinator of almond orchards. But there is more of a, a movement now to provide uh, cover crops for monarchs, to support monarchs and, and just pollinators in general. Um, and regardless of whether you would be able to um, qualify for the cover crop seed funding, um, there's definitely always technical assistance. Um, and I, I can actually uh, get that contact information for you. I meant to put it on there. Um, yeah. And then, um, of course, just general resources. Xerces Society is uh, 
obviously keeps coming up. Um, Monarch Joint Venture, their website has uh, lots of different resources and information about how you can get involved and ways that you can help um, support monarchs. Um, monarchwatch.org, they have a Monarch Waystation Habitat program um, where you can apply to have your existing habitat um, as a qualified way station. And um, it, it's, it's just, a, it provides a lot of information and resources for small scale landowners to um, install habitat. So, um, and then if, if anybody's interested, we, because uh, this grant is through CARCD and WCB, it's, we're pro providing lots of different, just, one or two page handouts on how you can help monarchs in different settings. So um, for example, there's one for what range, ranchers can do on their rangelands to conserve monarchs um, and address any issues with or concerns with uh, grazing conflicts, um, carbon fire farming for pollinators and um, just general milkweed planting guides. Um, there's just lots of different resources out there. So um, if anybody's interested um, in further information, would just be welcome to contact me. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so if, yeah, I will, I can provide my um, contact information through Andrea um, after this presentation as well. So if anybody had any questions, um, I would be happy to answer them if I can, and if we have enough time, it looks like we're over at this point. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, sorry, Sarah, that I didn't do a better job keeping us on time earlier. Um, oh, yeah. Let's see. So we've got all the, do, do you all see, I think you might see the contact information for Sarah up there now, as well as our other presenters. Um, they've all been generous to, to offer to be contacted directly with questions um, or to point folks to resources. Um, I'll, since we're a little over, uh, I'll just thank everybody for coming who is with us and um, let you go if anybody wants to stay, we do have, a, a question that came in for Sarah. So, you know, folks are welcome to jump off or stay for any other questions. I think Sarah, do you have a few more minutes probably? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, one question that came in is you showed a graph that uh, I think was from one of the, maybe the Thanksgiving count that showed a huge decline in monarch numbers um, in the, from the first year, I think it was either, well, the question says 98 or 97 between the next year. Do you, does, do we know what likely caused that decline? Oh, I wish I did. Um, I do not, but um, I am most likely the person or the people that would know would be, um, you, you might be able to reach out through um, westernmonarchcount.org um, or just Thursday Society in general. I don't know if Jessa Kate knows of any of this or is familiar with. Um, let's see, Jessa, are you still here? She may have had to okay. jump off. Yeah, I wish I knew the answer. Um, I'm trying to think of what changed at that time, but I, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, okay, so we'll, uh, like you said that it was the Monarch, you had a um, contact for the Monarch Count organization and somebody did ask about accessing your um, plant list and also, it sounds like those contacts would be of interest. So I will post um, your presentation as well on the workshops and events page of our solanohealthysoils.org website. Um, and I'll pull out maybe some of those individual plant lists and maybe the resources and make sure those are marked so um, folks can go there to get further information. Let's see, I think I might have a couple more things coming in in the chat. Um, it looks like just more requests for copies of the PowerPoints. They will all be, uh, well, I can speak for Sarah and Amy's PowerPoints will definitely be at the health, solanohealthysoils.org website. And I'm, I think it's likely that Jessa and Daniel will be happy to share those too. So hopefully they'll all be on that website. Um, 
see. Looks like that's everything for questions. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, it was great to spend the morning for you with everybody. Sorry that it took a little longer. Yeah, lots of thank yous coming in. So thanks Sarah and um, to all the other presenters. And um, yeah, again, for, for all the resources that we've been sharing, the information that Healthy Soils website at the bottom here is a good place where we're trying to consolidate things. That's one of the purposes of the website. And all of the presenters have um, agreed that it is fine to reach out to them directly at their emails with any follow-up questions. And we'll ask chat. Okay, yeah, thanks everybody. And we will, with that, end the meeting today. Thanks for coming.